so the, the players decided they wanted to start using the Bastion rules right in the middle of the campaign. So Jim is currently furiously going through his notes to try and find a place where he can stick Bastions into the campaign when he wasn't really planning on doing it before. So he's a little busy right now. So it's just Gazel. And I it's me. I'm that guy. Are you trying to add Bastions to your game right now? Oh, wait, you're not even playing. D no, but I wanted Bastion to use you what? Look, Barker just wanted like an old voided out ship to use as a bastion. And, you know, Matt's just going to have to deal with that. I don't know how it would work for Vecta, Eve of Ruin, I'm going to be honest, because we kind of sort of already have a base, but like it's not our base. So I don't know. Yeah, well, that's that's the problem. I want it for me. I don't know Get where you'd fit it in, though. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. I'm having some opinions of that campaign, by the way, or that adventure, I should say. Oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I am too. I am actually interested to hear what yours are. I mean, I don't know if I want to say too much till we're done, done. But like, I'm finding myself. I'm finding myself having a hard time getting invested, like the, the jumping around realities thing. Not super into it. Oh, that was. That's not really the crux of my issue. I don't know. For me, I I sort of feel more like like we're we're on the third world, right? And by the way, hi everybody. <laughs> I mean, yes, uh, uh, we're on like the whatever. third plane. <laughs> uh huh. And I feel like like the first bit, we had a bunch of Vecna stuff go on, and that was cool. And then there was like nothing in Planescape. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and now we're in the new place. And now I'm going to wonder if there's going to be Vecna stuff there. Or if so, it's just going to be every other plane until it becomes really relevant. I heard you know? a lot of people say Vecna's not very present until the end. Oh, I don't like that. Uh, OK, yeah. So my worst fears are confirmed. All right. <laughs> Not my worst fears, but that's that's a bummer. But, but, it's a bit of an overstatement, worst fears, but yeah, it's a bummer. Probably. I mean, I'm not 100% sure what people mean by that per se, but that is the thing I've seen mentioned on the internet mm -hmm. time to time. So, I don't know. Do with that information what you will. Well. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're not talking about Vecna Eve of Ruin, but we probably will at some point. Talking about bastions and wow, my voice has actually just gone down the toilet within the last hour or so. Yeah, it, it, it has taken a dive. The speed at which so. I got congested was miraculous, quite frankly. Um, uh, me thinks shorter session today, <laughs> so shorter episode today then? I'm not going to commit to that because then it never happens. When I say I'm going to do it, it doesn't happen. Better if I just don't think about it. Let's mm. see. Uh... Anyway, it, what shit what was like, oh, it, uh, yeah, the, the DMG is out. And I said we were going to talk about Bastions as their own thing because it's kind of its own big gamook of a mechanic and is one of the like big selling points of the DMG. So we're going to kind of talk about it. It's also like the the big new toy in the DMG, as it were. I mean, there's a couple of other new toys, but the Bastions is like the big boy. Uh, so yeah, before we do that, hit follow or subscribe so that I, you, you cure me vicariously through the internet, whatever sickness I've come down very and suddenly today. I woke up fine this morning for the record. So that's fun. Oh, that's how you know it's going to be bad if it's if like, if you woke up fine and now you're fucked, that, this is going to be L's, dog. I mean, we're going to find out. Um, what the hell did... Yes. Wow. Whew, memory slipping. Hit the follow button. That'd be nice. Hopefully by the time <laughs> you hear this, I'm already cured. So really, that's a moot point. But, you know, whatever. Here we are. Bastions. Uh, I have an opinion before we start. About? Bastions. Okay. I, when I first, so I did end up watching the video, uh -huh. um, 
That being said, I'm gonna be honest, I don't remember fucking any. It was like an hour long video. I mean, it's <laughs> it's very similar to what was in the UA. Yeah, final version. Um, yeah. So I, 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 you know, I watched the video. I saw what they had to say, and in my in my head, I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I thought about it for a second. And I'm like, this this would have been relevant to me like two years ago. So the hype for it, I guess, is not what it was what I wanted it to be because I'm like, well, I don't fucking need this anymore. Uh, yes, true. But I think something that's worth pointing out is if you run 5e again, you can really put bastions in your mind as like a focal point of the game. Uh, because I think there's there is quite a bit of potential to make them to make like the bastions essentially the the core focus in in so much as like your player characters have bastions in a town or whatever and the town is the crux of the narrative kind of thing. you know what i'm saying yeah you make it like your town and dungeon world and you know you can sort of reinforce your fronts around it something like that i mean if you take like my game right you guys were in the same city the entire campaign if i had the bastion system i could have potentially restructured a little bit and focused more around it and you could have used the city as an interesting staging ground uh that of course you know i could have done that on my own without the bastion system of course but that requires a lot more work but now that i have a thing it's like okay there's something here my opening opinion on bastions is um it uh it's weird they're weird they're not bad but i wouldn't say they're unequivocally good either uh so i'm just gonna give it a shot in the dark noodly a little esoteric and worth it with a little elbow grease i think worth it with a little elbow grease Noodly, not super noodly, but kind of a little all over the place in terms of what they do. Which I know is sounding mm. vague, but when I get to the special facilities, it make more sense what I mean. But like, there's a bit of a uh, there's a bit of like a confusion between. Out of confusion. There's some weirdness between which facilities, like some of the mechanics of the Bastions are purely roleplay stuff and aren't going to do anything or be useful in any way unless your GM helps you out. And some of it is really powerful mechanical shit. Like really powerful. Like have your... So I guess, are you... Are you... Go on. Well, ask the question because... Well, I was gonna say, are you are you therefore wondering what the point of some of it is if it is effectively useless? Some of it. Well, it's not that what the point of it is. It just feels a little conflicting. It it kind of it 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 kind of reminds me of a wider. I mean, to soapbox it a little bit, right? I think Five E has a problem in general with its game design, where Five E wants to be a mechanics or 5e is largely a mechanics first a mechanics first game but it kind of wants to be a fiction and storytelling focused game at the same time so wizards will like the design team at WotC will throw stuff in there that's like this is for role play and like flavor and stuff and people just fucking ignore it because they feel like well this is D&D, it's about the mechanics, right? The, the role play is sort of... The role play is secondary to the mechanics, whereas if you're playing Dungeon World, the mechanics are secondary to the role play or the fiction because the fiction is what actually drives the mechanics, whereas in D&D, the mechanics drive the fiction. That's not necessarily a criticism, it's, it's just sort of like, a, you know, that's kind of two angles you can come at game design. But... Because of that, yeah, wizards will often throw in stuff that feels like little roleplay tidbits or little narrative things and whatnot, and those end up getting largely ignored by most of the player base because the player base has not been trained to think about the game in that way and or doesn't care about that aspect of the game as much. 
So it feels weird because some of the bastions, like some of the special, the, the, core, the crux of the bastion system is the special facilities. Some of the special facilities are mucho god tier powerful, really useful, and some of the special facilities are cool, but little harder to justify because they just don't seem as good, you know? So like you really gotta say to yourself, how essentially am I gonna power game my bastion or not? Right? In the mm. same way that you kind of have to think about if you're gonna power game your character or not. Bastions, I think, are gonna have a similar issue. And the reason it feels a little weirder with the bastions is just because I feel like they should be one thing or the other. They should be mechanical or they should be role play. -y. They kind of are trying to skirt the line, so some of it feels weird. Mm -hmm. But as you said, with the elbow grease, I do think a DM can do a lot with this. There's a lot here to pull. There's a lot of threads to pull on if your DM is willing to pull on those threads and you as a player are, you know, playing along for the most part. That's the mm -hmm. that's the sort of high level review. Um, OK. In terms of the chapter itself, so starting from the front, so it basically just opens up with half a page of what is a bastion, how do the players get it, and some very, very broad, loose, like, lore justification. It's like it says, uh, the shape, style, and function of a character's bastion are up to the player to determine. For example, a wizard might build a tower, a cleric might establish a shrine, a fighter might build a fortified keep or a similar stronghold, and a rogue might establish a guild hall or a lodge. Very general, broad level, like, this is the kind of ideas that you could have for a bastion, and, like, that's kind of it. Um, that's, that's all you get in terms of what I would call fiction or lore writing in the Bastion chapter. Everything else in this chapter is mechanics. Everything else. So OK, a little bizarre, but all right. Yeah, I mean, and and just for context, in case anyone's curious, uh, let's see, 333 to. Let's see, two. Oh, one more. 352 so what is that 20, 19 pages 19 pages is how long the bastion chapter is you get half a page on some lore fluff writing and then mechanics all mechanics so kind of feels like the magic items chapter to be honest in that way yeah yeah I can see what you're saying do without what you will uh, it talks about the frequency. So it starts by talking about the frequency of Bastion turns, which by default, a Bastion turn occurs every seven days of in-game time. They then say, like, if that doesn't work, you know, you could do it based on just the pace of the, the narrative. So, like, the players have been away for a while, and then the GM says, let's just do a Bastion turn, or... Uh, you know, the characters have some time to hang out in their Bastion, so you say, let's do a couple of Bastion turns in a row. Uh, you could say, in the middle of an adventure, you know what, it's been roughly long enough to do a turn. It's basically just like, you can kind of pace it however you want. Seven days is the normal frequency, and then it says if you want to, like, slow it down, it says, for example, if the characters have months between adventures, you could call for a Bastion turn every month instead of every seven days. So the characters aren't issuing too many uh, orders or reaping too many rewards or reaping too many benefits at once. Um, but yeah, you could pace it out, but a week is kind of the default. I think a week will probably be fine for most games because I think most people tend to get pretty micro focused with D&D &D and tend to take things day by day. So a week is probably a pretty reasonable metric. But if you're a game that tends to be like, oh, the players dick around for a month and then something happens, then, you know, you can kind of adjust as you need. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then it talks about designing your Bastion map. Um, this is just fluff stuff. 
it it mentions like you could have so this is this is one of those weird things I was talking about. So it's like your bastion can have closets, corridors, ramps, and staircases, doors and windows, and you're like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Um, it, it specifies each facility comes with one or more doors and shuttered windows placed wherever the players see fit. Uh, doors in chapter three, uh, see doors in chapter three for the kind of doors you choose from, including locked doors, secret doors, pl- portcullises. These features are free. And you go, okay. But one of the things in this chunk, this half a page is defensive walls. So closets, corridors, ramps, staircases, doors and windows. That's just free fluff stuff. Defensive walls actually do something mechanically. Yeah, that, that seems a little. So it's weird that they're just kind of shoved in the middle there with the with the, you know, the non mechanical fluff stuff. It says yeah. a character can add defensive walls around their bastion. A defensive wall is 20 feet high and may include a walkway along its top uh, with means to access it, such as a ladder. Each five foot square of defensive wall takes 10 days to build and costs 250 GP. If a character's bastion is completely enclosed by defensive walls and it comes under attack, reduce by two the number of dice rolled to determine how many bastion defenders are lost in an attack. So that's a mechanic towards the end, but your bastion can get attacked and you could lose defenders. So if you have complete defensive walls, then reduce that by two and it costs 250 gold for a five foot square of wall. Five foot square of wall, meaning like, you know, it's not a five foot sized wall. Well, I guess maybe it is kind of yeah, maybe about a five foot wall. I guess that does sort of make sense, actually. So. Yeah, so fluff stuff and then a mechanical thing tucked away in there. So that's one of the one of one example of me being like, that's slightly odd. Uh, but you know, so basically you're probably not going to have enough when you first get the bastion, you're probably not going to have enough money to build a wall all the way around, but eventually you will. The thing that's weird here too, is it's like once you've completely encased your bastion, then the defensive walls do something. So if you just cover like one side or whatever, it's like, nope, doesn't do anything. You're like, oh, okay. That's a little disappointing. (laughs) Yeah. It's a little frustrating. I think, I don't know. I added a couple more tiers of defensive wall situation there. Uh, it then very briefly mentions combining a bastion. It's basically just like if two players want to put their shit together, like, you know, they can. Um, but in terms of defenders, generally treat a bastion as their defenders are separate unless one of the players like loans their defenders to the other or something like that. Uh, and they retain their own hirelings and whatever. So like fictionally, they're combined, but mechanically, they're basically separated. They don't yeah. mention having a mobile bastion at all, which I was a little sad about. I, I think a couple of people I've heard online mention the idea of a mobile bastion and nobody. There's nothing in the book about that, sadly. Yeah, I mean, we had the what the fuck was it? The Infernal Engine was like a house. It had beds in it. Yeah. So you could have done a thing there, but yeah, they just. Meh. Uh, Then you have facility space, which it just tells you. So this sounds like it's not going to be mechanical, but because the special facilities have sizes, this is mechanical. Uh, The facility space, you have cramped, roomy or vast. So a cramped space is four squares. A roomy uh, space is 16 squares and then a vast space is 36 squares. So that's easy to use. Uh, It then talks about basic facilities. So basic facilities the character starts with two free basic facilities which the the character's players choose from the basic facilities list below one of the chosen facilities is cramped and the other is roomy a bastion can have more than one of each basic facilities your basic facilities are a bedroom a dining room a parlor a courtyard a kitchen and storage they don't do anything at all So like your your bastion doesn't, you know, need to have like a bedroom for you to sleep in it or something like that. Like they have they do nothing. All right. Yeah. Well, so yeah, sorry. I'm keeping quiet because I'm trying to figure out what the design thought, like the design theory behind this is. I, I, like th- this, this so, feels annoyingly 5e. 
Yeah, where it's so like, it gets weirder. Were you going to give us any information? And they're just like, shrug? Yeah, well, there's a little more here, too. Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> so the basic facilities don't do anything. Like, And one of them is like, again, for example, a kitchen and a bedroom. It's weird that... So you could, for example, have a bastion where you have like a kitchen and a dining room, but no bedroom. Right? Like, weird. Yeah. If you want to add basic facilities, because you can, right? Uh, and it literally says basic facilities don't have any game effects, but they can inspire role playing opportunities and, and enhance a Bastion's verisimilitude. And that's not me adding. They literally put verisimilitude in the book. If that's the case, why just have them set up that way? Yeah, that's the weird part. But there's another weird part. <laughs> So if you want to add a facility, right? You're like, well, I have a dining room and a kitchen, but I would like a bedroom. If you would like to add a cramped facility, which is the four by four, 500 gold, 20 days to build. A roomy facility is a thousand gold, 45 days to build. A vast facility is 3000 gold, 125 days to build. So... You could be like, yes, I would like to add to my uh, bastion. I would like to make myself a vast bedroom. Cool. Uh, the campaign is probably going to end before your bedroom is finished. Yeah, I was just thinking that like the way that <sighs> the way that time is generally handled in 5e. Yeah, and you know, I don't know if this is a problem on the way that people play 5e or the way that it's pitched. And, you know, maybe you can disagree on me with this, but it felt like Every 5e game I've ever played in, save for yours, I think, when you were like, you guys have downtime, it never felt, well, no, that, well, we, there was a couple times where it felt like, oh, we don't have time for downtime. We have to do plot stuff, you know? Uh huh. It just feels like more often than not, I as a player don't feel like I have time to do a lot of things because the plot is ever looming and people like characters are, are going to die and towns are going to burn. Right. If you want to have a beach episode, you know what I mean? <sighs> well, I mean, I will say referencing my game specifically, I did sometimes shoehorn the downtime in there a little bit, uh, if for no other reason than to just give you guys a chance to do downtime things. Like, it maybe didn't make 100% fictional sense, but I put it in anyway, you know? Yeah. Um. So that's one option. But that's kind of what I was talking about in terms of... Well, yeah, yeah. So yes, I will say, I think the, I think the problem is the way the game is pitched. I think that the sales pitch of D&D is looming threat that you need to deal with quickly on top of the fact that uh, the game is more micro focused, right? A long rest healing takes one day, right? To fully heal all your shit takes one day. If the healing in the game was slower, that would slow things down. The, the sort of level progression is intended to be like, you know, sped up by going into dungeons and shit. And dungeon delving is obviously a very micro focused thing. Like, I think the game is pitched on a much more day to day kind of movement and that the downtime in between bits feel a little confusing because that's not so like the, the thing is, is the disconnect really is the way people used to play D&D &D and the way people play D&D &D now. Right. Because it, back in the day, the way D&D &D was played, the adventurers live in town Bimbalo fucking o. And then nearby Bimbalo fucking O is a bunch of dungeons and the adventurers are going to go into those dungeons and begin dungeon fucking so they may acquire loot and magic items so they may become rich and powerful dickheads, right? Like that was kind of the basic premise. So downtime makes a lot more sense because there's no looming threat. You go into the dungeon, try and get whatever you can and then you fuck off. The dungeon isn't gonna like thermonuclear meltdown in a week or anything. You could fuck off for yeah. a month and the dungeon will still be there. And the expectation was that if you fucked off for a month, the dungeon would change because the GM would be like, OK, you haven't done anything for a month. So the denizens of the dungeon have done X, Y or Z or factions have popped up in the dungeon that have started to fight each other or whatever, like shit like that. So that's kind of the old school way of D&D. 
5e has taken much more of a heroic narrative angle where it's like we have to save the universe from tiamat or whatever and that makes it a lot harder to justify downtime things when tiamat's cult is threatening the existence of the dimensions i mean we're literally and in case anyone's wants to potentially argue against my point here we're literally playing in the vecna eve of ruin campaign where Vecna is trying to destroy the entire multiverse and we have to get these magical rod pieces as fast as humanly possible. We don't have a week to dick around, you know? So like official wizards adventures are written in such a fashion that the downtime doesn't totally make sense, right? Yeah. So yeah, that is the problem, I think. But that's where we go back to what I was saying, where if you really base your campaign around bastions, you could do something with this, right? If you base the campaign around the idea that there's not going to be in a, a, a looming world ending threat and the players are going to have lots of time to be in their bastions and do stuff with their bastions, then you could do cool stuff there. But you need to have a campaign premise that's going to work with that. You need to have... You know, it needs to be, uh, like, you know, the, the premise of the campaign has to be like, we're explorers exploring the new world. So like we go out and adventure and then we come back to our bastions to, re to recuperate or something like, you know, the premise needs to be something like that to, to really make it, I think, to make it work really well. Yeah. Somebody may have a better idea. But that's my train of thought. You could also, if you go with the moving Bastion angle, which technically the book doesn't say anything about, but it would not be hard to make your Bastion mobile, right? It could be a giant Zeppelin or whatever. If you go with that angle, then you could say there is a world ending threat, but your Bastion goes with the players, so they still get to use it. Uh, so, yes, I think people are going to run into friction if they try and use the Bastion system and then do the usual... Like, I can't think, uh, the only, the only official wizard's adventure that I can think of right now that the Bastion system would work pretty well in, uh, is the adventure where they kind of already did it. And that's, uh, uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist into Dungeon of the Mad Mage, right? Because the premise is that you're in the Waterdeep City you acquire the tavern troll skull or the troll skull manor, right? That's what it's called. I think. I think so. Yeah. You you acquire the tavern. You live in the tavern, and then once you complete Waterdeep Dragon Heist, you go into the dungeon. But the dungeon is underneath the city, and there's not necessarily like an immediate looming threat. You're exploring the dungeon, and then you sort of discover a threat slowly. But it's not like Tiamat's going to be here in a week. You know. Yeah. Other than that, though, like Curse of Strahd, Descent into Avernus, uh, the icy one with Bird Lady that I can't think of the name of. Um, Icewind Dale. Icewind Dale, Eva Vecna, Eva Ruin. Like, I, uh, none of the other adventures do I think Bastions would work super well in. Actually, I, I, I do want to make an argument for Curse of Strahd, because Strahd, technically, there's no time limit. The, the whole point is you're stuck, right? True. True. You know, it's very it's very Samurai Jack back to the past. True. I, the and I think the, something that we could have benefited with with Strahd when Sam was running it was that feeling of like, you know, obviously not actually practice monotony, monotony, but the feeling of monotony, like our characters trudging back and forth to like, um, oh, God, what was the town right. called that that uh, our boy was at the one that we that died with Beric and but we had to revive him. Ishmael, uh, Isaac, Imric, something remember like Isaac. that. You know what I'm talking about. The kid with the the, the noble kid. Yeah, His yeah. Brother the, was a werewolf. The, the guy, yes, but wasn't wasn't yeah. isn't isn't Barovia also the town, right? Isn't it? No, that's the land. It's like the the not quite a nation, but like the. I thought it was both. I don't know because there were different towns we, we were we were in we went to different cities i know but i thought that starting town was barovia for some reason i don't know it doesn't really matter i see what you're saying um i think strad yeah strad's a weird the only thing is strad still has a little bit of a vibe of like strad's gonna fuck with you over and over again so like 
I guess it depends on how you handle Strahd, the villain, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, point being, yes, there's definitely going to be. There's definitely going to be campaign friction. Depending on your style of game, for sure. And yes, the fact that a vast facility takes 125 days means for a lot of campaigns, that's just not an option. Just remove it from the table. You're never going to do it. Yeah, which is, you know, perhaps frustrating to some people. Um, and then it also talks about you can enlarge your basic facilities uh, so you can go from a cramped to a roomy. That's 500 GP, 25 days or a roomy to a vast for 2000 GP in 80 days. So pretty big gold sink, pretty big time sink. I mean, massive time sink, sort of average gold sink, I would say. I'm going to be honest. Here's my thing, right? Even with like tools befitting the the renaissance, you know, late renaissance. I've yeah. seen entire like uh, wings of houses be put up in a week. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't necessarily know where the numbers come from. And I also don't know not enough about the time period to say. I mean, I suppose there's the argument for it would be a lot harder for them to get the materials and then you have to put the materials together and get the team going and everything like I don't know. I mean, 80 days is what just shy of three months. Maybe, you know, I don't yeah. know. Hard to say. Also, a lot of the stuff was made out of stone, right? So how much harder, how much does that slow you down? I don't know. I mean, to quote the D&D movie, just use magic to fix it. Like, <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, that's where you get into the argument of how ubiquitous is the magic in D&D, which is all other thing. And what? <laughs> of course, look, I'm playing through Baldur's Gate right now. According to Baldur's Gate, Pretty fucking ubiquitous. I mean, yes. A lot of randos have like really basic magic. I mean, yes, but also you get to the point of, you know, cantrips aren't necessarily going to help you use magic to build a house per se, but I don't know. There's a lot of factors. I don't know where they came up with the days. They do see a little long in the same way that the crafting a suit of plate mail seems to take a little too long, right? Similar problem. Uh, but that's the numbers they went with. I don't know how they decided their numbers. That's all I'm saying. And I don't know enough to do. I don't know how they decided. And I don't know enough to dispute. That's that's what I'm saying. Mm. Um, I will say mention because I mentioned the gold cost. So they said that one of the objectives is for bastions are to be gold sinks. Um, and like. Kind of. Sort of. So this is where you get into some of the if you weirdness. use them. Well, so well, if you use them, but so the basic facilities that I was just telling you cost money, right? But yeah, those don't do anything mechanically, right? Special facilities, which do the mechanical stuff, don't cost money to build. What? Yeah, you get them on level up. So you get your first, so you get your bastions at level five and you start with two special facilities. Level nine, you get two more. Level 13, you get two more. And level 17, you get, or no, sorry. Level nine, you go up to four special facilities. Level 13, you get five special facilities. And level 17, you get one more. So you have six total by level 17. But yeah, they don't cost anything. So... They don't have a monetary gold sink up front the way the basic facilities do. So if you're just trying to power game, you're literally never going to add basic facilities to your bastion ever. You're just going to use the special facilities because there's no reason for you to add the basic facilities. Why would you bother? Right? Yeah. It's, at that point, it's not a bastion. It's just a workshop. Yeah. Right. So it's like they gave you no incentive to add the basics. So it's not really a gold sink because if not now, I'm not even saying that I would do this, but if you're going to go purely in the power gaming mindset, I'm not wasting my gold on something that does nothing when I could be making magic items, especially because one of the things that a lot of the special facilities could do is craft magic items. So why am I spending money on a bedroom when I can craft a wand of magic missiles, right? Or a flame tug. Yeah. 
So that's some of the weirdness that I was talking about where I was like, that's an odd choice. Uh, but yeah, so you get them on level up and then the the special facilities are level locked. So like they have a level requirement next to them. So there's some level five ones, some level nine, some 13, some 17. Uh, and some of them have prerequisites. The prerequisites are all either spellcasting focus, holy symbol or druidic focus. Uh, one of them requires expertise in a skill. And then a bunch of them have no pre expertise specifically expertise. Yes. Expertise in, in a skill, any skill, any skill. Okay. And that's the guild hall. Um, but a bunch of the other ones require either an arcane focus, a holy symbol or a druidic focus. So. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, the special facilities take up a certain amount of space. Uh, which it just says in their description. Nothing particularly fancy there. Um, it mentions hirelings, so every special facility comes with one or more hirelings. Um, some of them have some options to expand the amount of hirelings, like you can add two. Some of them just have one permanently. Uh, the hirelings are mechanically sort of like an HP. Not, not even... The hireling has to be there to do work for you and like they can be like they can go away or whatever. So they're sort of a resource uh, and you can role play and name them and shit if you want, obviously, but you don't have to. Of course, the book encourages you like to, you know, name your hirelings and give them personalities, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and it says hirelings follow the uh, or uh, each special facility in a bastion generates enough income to pay a salary of its hireling. So they don't require any money. That feels like a weird choice to me. If you want this to be a gold sink, why not? Just, yeah, you don't have to pay them. Just yeah, like <laughs> Well, the implication fictionally you're paying them, but mechanically you don't have to pay them. But I feel like if you wanted this mechanic to be a gold sink of some kind, then just make it so you have to pay them. That seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, that's really not that big of an issue, right? It's like no. what normal wages for a week are a silver or something, right? Like, I mean, presumably these are specialized hirelings, so it'd be more expensive, but yeah. Well, even, well yes, but even then it's like, oh, no, we have three hirelings. We need to pay them one three. gold piece a day. Yeah, yeah, three gold or whatever. Yeah, one gold piece a day. So what, seven gold a week or whatever? Like, yeah, but it is still another thing to sink money into. If you want that to be part of this mechanic, which I I do think it being a gold sink should be part of it. You know, like, I think that makes sense. So it's a little weird. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it has the opportunity for massive boon. You got to put some money in. Yeah, some of the, So this is the other witness. Some of the special facilities to do the thing that they do require money. Some don't. So that's some of the other kind of. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then you have your Bastion orders. Now, technically, all of the orders have like an itemized list, but the itemized list kind of doesn't matter because the special facility just tells you what what it can do in its description anyway. So like you have craft, empower, harvest, maintain, recruit, research and trade. But when you go to look at the special facilities, it just says craft, whatever. And then it just tells you how it works in the special facility description anyway. So the list of them being explained isn't super useful. You, I guess you could kind of think about the orders uh, like schools of magic. So like if you're looking at the table, because they have a table of all the special facilities, it says on the right what type of order they can do. So I guess if you don't want to flip to the page, you could just see like, oh, this one does crafting. Okay, let me look at it, I guess is the idea behind that. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, and then it goes into the special facilities and they are alphabetical. As you might imagine. Or they're are they? Oh, yeah, the, the pages are alphabetical. The table is not the table is broke. So so the table is by level and then alphabetical within the level. Does that make sense? So like the level five yes. 
uh, special facilities are grouped together and then alphabetical by themselves. Yes, that's that's actually how I want the spells to be done, which yeah. is the whole thing. Um, so you start with the arcane study. This has a prerequisite of an arcane focus or a spellcasting focus. It tells you, so I'm not going to read this for all of them, but like it says space, roomy. So it's uh, what, uh, 16 squares. Yes, roomy. So the arcane focus is 16 squares. Comes with one hireling and the order is craft. Uh, this The arcane study, you can give yourself a charm uh, that lets you use identify without spending a spell slot. And the craft options, uh, you can have them make... Uh, you can have them make a um, arcane focus for you at for free. Just free. You can have them make a blank book for you for 10 gold. Takes them a week. They make a blank book. Uh, I don't necessarily know what you would might use that for, but it's a thing. I, I don't know. I, I'm just this sort of feels very Conan Exiles. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> It feels very dig the whole hole digger. Like. I mean, maybe. <laughs> and then if once you hit level nine plus, you can craft in our. So you remember that the magic items are now broken up into the four types. Uh, yes. So you can craft an arc and a common or uncommon arcana magic item with the arcane study. Uh, you have to pay what it would. You have to pay what it would cost for you to craft the magic item based on the crafting rules. Um, and if you if you're however, if you're making an item that uses a spell. Uh, you have to do it. So if you want to make a wand of magic missiles, you have to prepare magic missiles and you have to craft the item and have the spell prepared every single day that you are crafting said item. So certain so hirelings cannot make all the magic items for you. They, they can make the ones that are not tied to a specific spell. Yeah. Um, that is technically a gold sink, but it's a gold sink through the crafting system, not really the bastion system. So, yeah. Uh, then you have the, the archive. This is a level 13 facility. Uh, you can research helpful lore. Uh, tell the, tell the hirelings to research for a week. Uh, the hirelings gain knowledge of this as if they had cast the legend lore spell and then share this knowledge with you. Um, also, your archive contains a copy of a reference book, which gives you a benefit while the book, well, you, which, which gives you a benefit while you and the book are in your bastion. Uh, and then it gives you a list. There's one that basically they all give you advantage on a different check. Advantage on Arcana, Adventures on History, Adventures on Investigation, Adventures on Nature, Adventures on Religion. That's what they all do. You just pick which book you have in your archive. And then enlarging the okay. archive costs you 2000 GP, but you gain two additional reference books. So that's a gold sink that actually does something of value, right? Because you get two more of those books. So that's what I mean, where some of them have gold sink attachment and some of them kind of don't. Yeah, some of them feel relevant. The other ones just kind of feel slapped on. Yes. Uh, then you have the armory. Uh this one you could trade, which is basically you have. Uh, what is it? Your uh, your your hirelings stock a bunch of armor in your armory. Uh, the equipment costs you 100 GP plus an extra 100 GP for each defender in your bastion. Um, if your bastion has a smithy, you could cut the cost in half. While your armory is stocked, they're harder to kill. Uh, and instead of the D6, you roll a D8 on the Bastion events table, which gives them a better chance of, you know, being unscathed. But once the event happens, uh, they deplete the armory, so you have to, like, restock it. That one is an okay gold sink that does something. Yeah. Sorta. Well, it only does that something. Feels... It only does something if you get attacked. Yeah. Not... If your GM never attacks your facility, then no. There is a mechanic where they're supposed to, but they could, you know, ignore it hypothetically. Yeah, they could just not. Uh, the barracks. Uh, anytime you issue a recruit order from the barracks, this is a uh, level five facility. The armory is level five. The barracks are level five. Uh, so level five are the starting ones. Uh, when you do the recruit order, uh, it doesn't cost you any money. 
Uh, you get some extra defenders, or you get defenders, period. Um, and the defenders in your bastion defend the bastion. That's... yeah. Um, and then, if you want, you can enlarge the barracks with another, again, 2,000 gold to accommodate 25 bastion defenders. Um, and essentially what that means is a bigger health pool. Because bastion defenders die off when you get attacked. Uh, Honestly, I do. I'm starting to like the idea of just playing Conan Exiles in D and D. I mean, and having to do the like raids or whatever they're called. The the that would be a little tricky. You could, I mean, I guess you could do it with this system. It would just there'd be a little like um, nuts and bolts you need to twist. But you know, there's something there, I suppose. <clears throat> Then we have the level 17 facility. So this is one of the big boys, the Demi Plane. Uh, this requires you to have an arcane focus or spellcasting tool. Uh, it is literally you slap a portal on a wall somewhere in your bastion that leads you to your own little personal wizard Demi Plane that you could just exist in. Uh, you make your own little pocket dimension. Which I thought Interesting. Was, okay. That was pretty funny. Uh, when you issue the empower order to this facility, magical runes appear on the demiplane walls and last for seven days until the runes disappear. You gain temporary hit points equal to five times your level after spending an entire long rest in the demiplane. The wizard God just damn. goes into their demiplane and temporary hit points. Yeah, and comes out with up to 100 temporary 100 hit points. 100 temp HP at max, yeah. Which I... That's a little that's a little nuts. A little wild, but it is one of the level 17 ones. And you have to long rest in the demi plane. You have to be there. Uh, you can also take a magic action in the demi plane to create a non magical item of your choice. The object can be known bigger than five feet. The object uh, yeah, can be known bigger than five feet in any dimension. and can't have a, a gold value over five gold. So you just make uh, I need a sword fabricate sword nice weird all right yep yep um n again no real gold sink on this one uh level nine facility you have the gaming hall this is kind of a fun one uh a gaming hall basically it you can <laughs> a gaming hall just makes you money uh, you can have your hirelings gamble. When you issue the trade order, the facility's hirelings turn the gaming hall into a gambling den for a week. At the end of the seventh day, roll a D100 and consult the following table to determine your portion of the house's winnings. And there's no way to Is lose. Is it me or does that seem kind of evil? That's like a little bit. Yeah, we're going to we're going to have the people that we pay run the gambling house den? and feed run a gambling den that they will always be paying into us because we are the house. Uh, well, presumably they are also the hirelings are getting paid through the gambling also based on the fact that. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I just. But I think the funny thing is it literally just makes you money no matter what. Even if you roll a one, you still get one D six times ten GP. So bare minimum, okay. ten gold, even if you roll yeah, like bare minimum, you're always going to make something. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, then you have a garden. The. <laughs> Again, so like the gambling hall, right, is one that I think a lot of players are going to be like, well, I'm definitely taking that. That's guaranteed money, right? Yeah. The garden, uh, you can issue the harvest order and you commission your hirelings to collect items from the garden as noted on the gardening table. So you can have a decorative garden, a food garden, an herb garden, or a poison garden. A decorative garden gets you 10 exquisite flower bouquets worth 5 GP each, 10 vials of perfume, or 10 candles. Like, okay. A food garden gets you 100 days worth of rations. An herb garden, uh, you can either make 10 healer's kits or a potion of healing. Only one potion of healing. Or the poison garden. One? One. Yeah. Or the poison garden... Uh, you can either create two vials of antitoxin or one vial of basic po uh, poison. So one of them is like oh. you make pretty bouquets. One of them is you make food for 100 days. This is what I mean, where some of them are just like the obvious better option. Yeah, dude, this is getting annoying. I just like 
Uh, you can also enlarge your garden. Um, also, again, the harvesting from the garden costs nothing. Uh, 2,000 GP to make your garden bigger. Um, and you can have two types of the same garden or two different. So you could have two herb gardens or like a, a food and a poison garden or something like that. Basically, you have two from the table. And you get another yeah. hireling. Uh, greenhouse, another level nine facility. Uh, this one you harvest. Uh, one plant in your greenhouse has... Uh, three magical fruit grow fruits grow fruit fruits growing on it. I don't know what that was so hard. Um, any creature that eats one of these fruits gains the benefit of lesser resto spell. The fuck. Uh, yeah, the fruits that aren't eaten within twenty four hours of being picked lose their magic. So basically, three lesser restos a day. Keeping in mind, I I don't know if I said this before or not. You can only issue Bastion orders if you are there at your Bastion or if you have a way to communicate with your Bastion. So like the sending spell, for example. Um, right. So it's not like they just do all this stuff all the time for free, right? You have to be there or communicate with them in some fashion. Yeah, but like that's not not that if you are, for hard. example, a wizard, just shoot him a sending yes. on deal. Yes. But I'm just like, hey, don't forget to pick my garden. Yes. Although it is kind of funny because that does mean fuck you, fighter, I guess. I mean, you, you list it as part of the spell, right? Like pick the garden, you know, make us money. Well, I'm saying no, because the fighter can't. The fighter has to order issues, has to or, or issue orders to his bastion. And he doesn't have sending. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I mean, obviously, as a GM, you could just be like, yeah, the wizard can do it. It's fine. But like, you know, technically rules is written. Yeah, rules is written. Get fucked. Yeah. Um, other option, you can then harvest from your garden. So you can either get herbs, uh, which creates you a potion of greater healing. Uh, seven days, no money, one potion of greater healing. Uh, or you can harvest a poison, which uh, it, you can take a couple of the poisons it gives you a list of like three poisons from the poison chapter in the DMG. So healing potion or poison if you have a greenhouse. Essentially, the the greenhouse is the upgraded version of the garden. Yeah. And you have the guild hall. This is the one that this is a level 17 one, and this requires expertise in a skill. So, you know, rangers, rogues, bards. Uh. You could do an Adventurer's Guild, a Baker's Guild, a Brewer's Guild, a Mason's Guild, Shipbuilder's Guild, or Thieves' Guild. Um, and you can also create a new guild if you have, like, an idea for something. Uh, so this one is kind of funny because... So, like, the Adventurer's Guild, you can send adventurers to track down a beast that has a CR 2 or lower and is known to lair within 50 miles of your bastion. The adventurer slay or capture the creature in 1d6 plus 1 days. If the creature is slain and your bastion has a trophy room, you can add it to the trophy. To, you can add a trophy taken from the creature to that facility. If the creature is captured and your bastion has a menagerie, you can add the creature to that facility, provided it has space. And you might say, okay, what is taking a... Tr uh, the menagerie is like, all right, I have a creature in my, you know, my zoo. Well, it's a petting zoo, basically. Uh, the menagerie actually does something, but you might say, does the trophy in the trophy room? What does that do? Literally nothing. nothing. Yep. Nothing at all. Because the trophy room, which is its own special facility, literally says you don't need to have any sort of specific trophies to use this. So. Yeah. Love it. I don't know why they mentioned that. Uh, conversely, if you have a baker's guild, you can assign your bakers to create baked goods for a prestigious event, and you could receive payment in coin, 500 GP, or form a favor owed to you by the event host. So you can have your adventurer's guild go get you a goofy trophy, or have your bakers make some sick bread and get 500 gold for free. 500 and... Keep in Level, mind, 
Not, mind you, level, one potion of healing. Level 17, level 17 facility, this one. And the potion of healing from the garden is level five. So 500 gold at level 17, not as valuable, but yeah. Worth pointing out. Yeah, for sure. But yes, not, you know, not as valuable, but yeah. Uh, basically, that's how the guild hall works. You decide what kind of guild it is, and then you issue an order, and they, they do the thing based on the kind of guild that they are. You got your laborator- laboratory. Uh, laboratory lets you craft stuff. Uh, your your facilities hirelings can make anything that you could make with alchemist supplies with the laboratory. Uh, 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 but you still have to follow the crafting rules, so it's not free. Um, or you can have them make a poison, a different. So the poisons on the laboratory and the poisons from the greenhouse are different. So it's not like they completely overlap or anything, but it is another case of make some poisons. Uh, then you have another level five Bastion option. The, Wait, real quick. Yes. Do you get any boons for having the lab and the garden to make poison? Can you like make better poisons if you have both? Not rules as written. Love it. Uh, yeah, no, but it is a different list. So if you want to make both, you do like if you want to make. Uh, for example, if you want to make the essence of ether. And the pale tincture, then you need to have a greenhouse and a laboratory. Also, they are. Oh, never mind. They're both level nine. So, yeah. But yeah. So you'd need to have both if you want to make both poisons. Technically. Or you could have them both craft the same thing. That's probably the more beneficial use, right? Because you only get one from, you, you know, you can only do one order per facility and you only get one thing. So if you want to have two of the same, I don't know, they have a different list. What am I talking about? <laughs> Never mind. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you wanted like an upgraded version, I don't know. Your GM would have to like make a. The thing is, the poisons in the poison list don't have upgraded versions themselves. So you'd have to think of what the upgraded version of the poisons might be, you know? Which would be. Yeah, it's true, I suppose, because the poisons don't come from plants a lot of the time. They come from like monsters. Uh, Yeah, well, they can. Yeah. And, and some of the poisons in the poison list will be easier, I think, to come up with a powered up version than others. So you just got to kind of figure that one out. Um, but mm. I'm sure you could. Uh, but level five, another level five, you have the library. Basically, library, uh, you issue a research order. The topic can be a legend, a known event, location, a person of significance, a type of creature or a famous object. The work takes seven days. When the research concludes, the, ac the hireling obtains up to three accurate pieces of information about the topic uh, that were previously unknown to you and shares the knowledge with you. The next time you speak with them, uh, the DM determines what the information is. There's a bunch of those where it's like they go and get you information on a topic and they get you three pieces of info. There's a there's a couple of those spread spread around. <laughs> then you have the meditation chamber. This is level 13. This one is so good. <laughs> uh, and again, free inner peace so when you issue the empower order to the facility your bastion hirelings can use the meditation game chamber to gain a measure of inner peace the next time you roll for the bastion event roll twice and choose either result so you get advantage on your bastion event roll which is quite good yeah and then fortify self you can meditate in the in this facility over a period of seven days uh if you leave the bastion during this time you gain no benefit Otherwise, at the end of the seventh day, you gain advantage on two kinds of saving throws for the next seven days. Oh, uh, roll. Ra uh, what does it say? Uh, blah, blah, blah. yeah, it's seven days determined randomly by rolling on the table. So you don't get to pick, but you get advantage on two saving throws for a week. For meditating in the meditation chamber. That's quite just strong. <laughs> Yeah, just free 99. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and both of those cost nothing. So again, money sink a little all over the place. Some things cost shit and some things just don't at all. Just don't, yeah. Yeah, they just don't. 
and some of them have options to make them bigger and some of them just don't which is also kind of a weird one the menagerie uh this is your zoo uh when you you when you issue the recruit order commission the facility to add creatures from the menagerie creature table take seven days and cost you an amount listed on the table there's a table here uh, ape, 500 gold. Black bear, 500 gold. Brown bear, 1,000 gold. Constrictor snake, 250 gold. Dire wolf, 1,000 gold. Giant vulture, 1,000 gold. Hyena, 50 gold. Jackal, 50 gold. Uh, so that one has a money sink and a decent amount. Uh, creatures in your menagerie count as Bastion Defenders. Deduct any you lose from your Bastion Defenders roster. You could choose not to count one or more of these creatures as defenders, in which case they can't be called on to defend. Instead, they act in accordance with their nature based on their stat blocks of the monster manual. Uh, so, yeah, and that's why the adventurer thing had the option to add a creature to the menagerie. That's another way you could do it. Uh, but basically, hmm. you could have, you know, four dire wolves act as your house guards. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Well, I do love that. It is. Yes, it's very funny. It is a little weird, though, that when your Bastion gets attacked, there is literally no way to not take at least some damage. Like the defenders are. Oh, you can't like perfectly repel them. I, I, not that I. I mean, I may have misread, but as far as I can tell, no. But that's a little odd. Um. And then it also mentions if your GM wants to give you creatures that aren't on the list, uh, it gives you a cost based on challenge rating option for the DM to like, you know, throw some weird thing in there that isn't on the list. Your observatory at level 13 requires a spell casting ability to use a spell casting focus. Uh, you can look into wild space in the astral plane, spend a long rest. You gain a magical charm for a week. The charm allows you to cast contact other plane without expending a spell slot. Uh, you can't use this charm again while you still have, or you can't gain the charm while you still have the charm. You can't get more than one. I don't know why I said that in a complicated way. Because the book words, uh, the exact wording of the sentence is, you can't gain this charm again while you still have it. I don't know why they didn't just say you can't have more than one charm. But whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess. Yeah, no, because you can't double up. Uh, yeah. Uh. But um, so, yes, you have the option of the. Uh, so you could get the contact other plane or Eldritch Discovery. And this is like the uh, which was it? The, the library where the hirelings can go out and get you tidbits of information. Um, let's see, it's, uh... Oh, never mind. Nope, that's not the ability. Sorry, right, this one is... Uh, issue the order, enable yourself to the higher legs to explore. At the end of the night, roll a die. If the number is even, nothing. If the number is odd, an unknown power bestows one of the following charms on you, and then there's a couple of charms. So, contact other plane or a couple of charms from that one. Uh, you have the pub at level 13, which I think a lot of people are going to like the pub. Um, it, oh, this is what I was thinking of. The inf so gathering information from the pub is like I was saying, you said you get you get awareness of important events within 10 miles of your bastion over the next week. During that time, spies divulge the location of any creatures familiar to you, provide the creatures within 50 miles. Yeah, yeah you send out some spies to get some deets, basically. Um, and then the pub has a special. Oh, yeah, I like that one a lot. Huh? I said, no, that, that one's cool. I like that one a lot. Uh, yeah, that's a fun one. Also, I was <laughs> full disclosure. Uh, as you finished, I was yawning and I was like, no, it's not over yet. The yawn isn't done. Please, please <laughs> hurry up. The dead air. Uh, I see. Um, yeah. Also, the pub gets a drink special, um, and there's a list. There's Bigby's Burden, Kiss of the Spider Queen, Moonlight Serenade, Positive Reinforcement, and Sterner Stuff. They all have different mechanical effects, but they're basically like potions. Uh, Bigby's Burden oh, I love that. gives you the enlarge effect from the magical drink, for example. 
oh, they have like spell effects. I thought yeah. it was like, you know, the typical advantage on no, you know, I mean, persuasion or so whatever. like sterner stuff, uh, you automatically succeed on saving throws to avoid or end the frightened condition. Uh, Moonlight Serenade gives you dark vision. Uh, positive reinforcement gives you resistance to necrotic damage. Oh, yeah. Who the fuck is your bartender? A wizard. Volo? <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. Um, and then you can enlarge the pub for 2000 GP to have two magical beverages and some more hirelings. It's, it specifies you gain three additional hirelings for a total of four. These new hirelings are servers, assigned names and personalities to them as you see fit. Uh, oh. I thought it was funny. It specifies that they're like waiters. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> kind of love the idea of naming your your <laughs> servers after people that you've worked with. Uh, you know, that could be really that cursed. Way you can, like, cursed or hilarious. Yeah, I was like, God damn it, Jimmy. You're like, who's Jimmy? Don't fucking worry about yeah, it. It's, just, it's like, wait, is that in character or out of character? Who the fuck is this Jimmy? It's like, don't worry about it. It can be both. Yeah. Uh, you have your level, another level 13, the reliquary. Uh, spend a long rest. After spending a long rest, you gain a magical charm that lasts for seven days. Charm allows you to cast greater resto once without expending a cell slot or material components. Again, you can only have one. Um, the reliquary, by the way, you have to have a holy symbol or a druidic focus. Uh, and then you can harvest. When you choose the harvest, you commission your highlights to produce an unusual prepared or a specially prepared talisman for you to use. Uh, you know, some sort of religious thing. Uh, the work takes seven days and costs no money. The talisman. You can use this talisman in place of one spell's material components, provided the, the components have a cost of less than a thousand GP. If the spell normally consumes its components, the talisman isn't consumed. After the spell has been used this way, it can't be used again until you return it to your reliquary and use another harvest order. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good one. Some of these. So you basically have infinite free revives. Not quite, I think but you can, in that realm, yeah. Oh, I think resurrection is a thousand GP, right? Like, I don't know off the top of my. Because yeah, raise dead is five hundred. I'm checking now because that's that's uh, wild. That's like relevant. Yeah. I mean, like I said, some of these are way more powerful than others. Let's see. Uh, uh, Resurrect. Get there. Uh, what? Bro, what the fuck? It's not showing up on the spell list. Why are you showing up on the fucking spell list? I don't know. Brother. <laughs> uh, In class, cleric. 5e e tools, what are you doing right now? What? You having a laugh? You want me? Anyway. Uh, it, keep going. I'm, I'm going to keep looking yes. into this. This is getting weird. Um, a level nine bastion facility, the sacristy, sacristy. Not really sure. I suppose it um, also requires holy symbol or druidic focus. Uh, you can craft holy water. Uh, so you can craft holy water uh, and it costs no money. Or you could spend 100 GP during the process for every 100 GP up to a maximum of 500. You could increase the damage dealt of the holy water, holy water by 1d8. So you Just make it whole actual holy hand grenades. I kind of yeah, love that. 6d8 six, six holy water. Oh, biggie. That's fantastic. Uh, by the way, I was right. Yes, resurrection, seventh level spell, uh, 1000 GP. Sounds about right. So just free... Free resurrections for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. The yawn was contagious on that one. A little one. bit, yeah. Uh, or you can have the the sacristy craft a a relic magic item of common or uncommon value. Uh, or and <laughs> this one I find very odd. So having a sacristy allows you to regain one expended spell slot of level five or lower after spending an entire short rest in your bastion 
You can't gain this benefit again until you finish a long rest. I I find that one really odd, because, like, are you going to, like, oh, guys, I know we just, like, had a fight, but can we just go short rest in the house real quick and then go back out? Yeah, can we run all the way home? Yeah, can we run home real quick so I can get a spell slot? Like, that's kind of a weird one. I don't know. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little strange. Uh, level five one, the sanctuary. Uh, you can gain a charm. The charm allows you to cast healing word once a day without expending a spell slot. A lot of them do the use a spell once. Uh, or they can craft you a focus, which I why? <laughs> I don't know what the point of having a focus be crafted for you is, but that is a thing that the sanctuary can do. Yeah, I mean, especially like you can just go buy one. Like, yeah, and you start. I don't do anything in particular. They just sort of exist. Well, they exist as a as like a way to subvert an ammo mechanic type thing. But yeah. Yeah, but like they don't it's not like every uh, if you cast any spell of seventh level, your wand disintegrates, right? It's not like you're in a yeah, you're, yeah, not, you're not, not loading anywhere. your fucking focus. No. Yeah, so it's kind of a weird thing. Uh, mm, uh, yo, it, 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 Scrimbly Bimbly the Warlock is not firing off Elgis Blast and then his magic wand is like re 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 reload, re 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 reload. Like what the fuck? It'd be kind of <laughs> funny if he was, though. <laughs> True. Uh, then you got the Sanctum at level 17, which, you know, sanctuary up to a Sanctum. Uh, uh, after spending a long rest in your Bastion, uh, you get a charm. You may notice a lot of them give this charm thing. The charm allows you to cast heal once per di- once without expending a spell slot. Heal spell for free. Just 70 hit points for free 99? Yes, free 99. For the low, low cost of one week in your Bastion. Uh, and then you- I mean, that's... That's not terrible, though. Like, you're in there for a week, you're on downtime. Yeah. You know at some point... Someone's going to get a f- basically full heal at that point for a week of, you know, you're not going to be doing much else, but. Yeah, it's a, eh. it could be worse. It could be worse. Uh, then you got the fortifying rites. Uh, when you issue the empower order, you inspire your hirelings to perform daily rites that benefit you or another character you name. The beneficiary doesn't need to be in the bastion. Uh, each time the beneficiary finishes a long rest, they gain 10 hit points equal to your level. Oh, it was kind of funny. You could just bless a homie five miles away. You're just like, oh, I feel great. <laughs> Weird. I do kind of love that. You're just like, oh, I suddenly feel a lot better. Yeah. Huh. Oh. <laughs> Must be Jesus. Uh... And while the Sanctum exists, you always have Word of Recall, the Word of Recall spell prepared. Whenever you cast Word of Recall, you can make your Sanctum the destination of the spell instead of another place you previously designated. In addition, one creature of your choice that arrives in the Sanctum via the spell gains the benefit of a heal spell. Just yoink a homie back and then they're healed. Yep, just you literally... (laughs) You literally do the 14 thing as a white mage where you just yank a homie yep. out of a damage zone. Yep. <laughs> uh, level nine, the scriptorium. Uh, you can fish you, you commission the facilities hirelings to make a copy of a non-magical book requiring doing so requires a blank book. Okay. Oh, now it becomes fucking relevant. <laughs> Oh Sorta, my god. But it doesn't do anything. You just make a non-magic you make a copy of a non-magical book. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought never mind. It's not like a spell book. I <sighs> Yeah. Yeah, never mind. I just okay. Yep. These fucking books, dude. I don't <laughs> I don't know. Uh then you can craft a spell right. scroll. You commission the facility's hireling to scribe a spell scroll containing a cleric or a wizard spell of third level or lower. Uh the facility has all the stuff they need. The crafting equipment exception specifies how much time is needed to craft the scroll and the cost. Or you could have them do paperwork. You commission the facility's hirelings to create 50 copies of a broadsheet, pamphlet, or other loose leaf product. Uh, the work takes seven days and costs you one GP per copy. 
at no additional per cost. copy per copy yeah brother <laughs> so 50 gp at most that's a lot of money to have your boys make some fly some flyers you're <laughs> you're spending more money in materials than you are spending in work yes uh, at no additional cost of time and money, the facility's oh hirings can distribute the paperwork to one or more locations within 50 miles of your best year. So you could just run a newspaper, I guess. I love that Wizards of the Coast have just reinvented capitalism. I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the train of thought is on that one, but yeah. Oh my god. Uh, what are your level five boys is the smithy. This one pretty much does what you think it can do. Uh, you can craft stuff that smith tools could craft, or you can make armaments, magic item armaments at level nine plus. The same as the other. That's cool. I like that. I mean, it's the same as the uh, whatever the other basic level five. Which one was it? It's the same effect, different category as the was it the library or something? Sanctuary. Oh, one yeah, true. One of them, yeah. So. Yeah, there there is one facility per magic type to make. So like Smithy does armaments. I think it was was it the li the library? No, which one does the? No, one of them did relics. Of course, now I can't. The reliquary. Reliquary, maybe. Yeah. Nope, wasn't that one. No. Oh. Uh, it was the sacristy. Did sacristy. I. Okay. Why do they choose that word? I don't. I don't. Because they already use sanctuary, I guess. I suppose it's just that is that is an, an old word to the point of it being so esoteric. Like you're like, what the? Fuck? Yeah. Stable. Um, you can you can have one riding horse or camel and two ponies or two mules. Uh, the facility is big enough to house three large animals or two medium creatures occupy the same amount as a large creature. Uh, after a beast that can serve as a mount spends 14 days in the facility, all animal handling checks made with respect to it have advantage. You can trade your animals. Can you should the trade order uh, your hirelings buy or sell one or more mounts at normal cost, uh, keeping the ones in your uh, you buy in your stable. Takes them seven days. The mounts and other animals in the player's handbook give standard pricing. You can sell a mount from your stable. The buyer pays 20% more than the standard price. The profit margin increases to 50% when you're level 13 and 100% when you're level 7. So you can just buy and hawk horses all day long. But yeah, I, I, sort, I sort of saw it like the um, what do they call it? The, the Pokemon daycare, uh, something like that. Yeah. And then you could spend 2000 GP to enlarge your facility and house six large animals. <laughs> so you can I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people that buy a stable and just turn into fucking horse jockeys. Yeah, well, because you're 100 xing your profit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why did they just reinvent capitalism? I, I, <laughs> I you know, I really could tell you, but uh, yep. I guess because they figured your fucking adventure is doesn't matter anyway. I don't know. I suppose so. <laughs> so then you have the store in house. between the dragon horde you're taking. You're like, oh, look, 500 gold. Yeah. Ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. Uh, and then you have the storehouse, which is a level five bastion. It does the same thing as a stable, except you're selling generic trade goods instead of horses. Are you also 100 xing your profit yes. margins? Yes. At level 17. Anyway. Okay. All right. All right. The, uh, level 17 for both of them to, to double your profits. But yeah. So, yeah. Storehouse and stables are going to be, uh, you know, if you want to just be, I don't know, a grocery baron. There you go. Uh, Level nine. You I can, love reinventing feudalism. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. At level nine, you can make a teleportation circle and you can summon a wizard to your uh, bastion and have them just cast a, uh, a level four spell. Uh, if you're level 17 plus, they can cast a level eight spell for you. Uh, the spells caster is assumed to have all their stuff and material, uh, but 
if they need material components, you have to pay them for the material components they are using. Uh, they stay for two weeks or until they cast the spell. They will not defend the Bastion and they fuck off if the Bastion gets attacked. So you just summon up your buddy, you know, Jimbo the Sorcerer and like, hey, you want to cast Gate for yeah, me or you whatever? you just call up Morden Cannon and you're yeah. like, hey, bud, I need some help. He's like, dude, are you fucking kidding me right now? It's four in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and then he just stays at your house for two weeks eating your food and shit. Yeah, he was, I was about to say, eating your food, shitting in your toilet, yeah. leaving his dirty socks on the couch. Yeah. Pain uh, in my ass. Level nine, you could get a theater. I don't have the chutzpah to read this whole one, but basically you could put on a performance and other players can help you. They can be the writer, the director, or a performer in the performance. Then you make a performance check. If you succeed... Everyone gets a theater die, which is either a D6 and then it bumps to a D8 at level 13 and a D10 at level 17. And you could use the theater die like a bardic inspiration die. What uh, is the time limit on it? Uh, 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 forever. Oh, oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. You cannot stack well, them. You can only have one. But yeah, there's no time limit just have a bardic inspiration die so the theater also pretty strong or just looking at the party my joke to you uh, yeah apparently yes yes you are uh then you have the training area another level nine and uh basically you get uh you have a couple of different options of types of trainers so for example you have a battle expert when you take damage from uh, basically you take the empower action, you train with the trainer. When you take damage from an attack made with an unarmed striker weapon, you could take a reaction to reduce the damage by a D4. Uh, or you could have the wow. tools expert where you gain proficiency with a tool of your choice. Or you can have the weapons expert where choose a kind of simple or martial weapon. If you aren't proficient, you gain proficiency. If you are proficient, you gain mastery. Oh, yeah. Now, this only lasts for a week. Just kind of funny. Like, yeah, I had this guy show me how to use a spear and then I used it for a week. But now I need to go back to show about how to use. The spear <laughs> yeah, it's again. like uh, I might need more training. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Uh, you know, fictionally kind of hilarious. Mechanically, I get it, but fictionally a little goofy. Uh, then another level nine, there's the trophy room. Uh, this is another research one. Uh, you do the research, you get three pieces of accurate information about the topic. It's another one of those. You commission the facility's hirelings to research a topic of your choice. The topic can be a legend, a creature, or a famous object. The topic need not be directly related to items on display in the room. So that's why the whole getting a trophy from the Adventurers Guild just does nothing. <laughs> Does it need to be related? I see. Yeah. I suppose you could maybe homebrew an idea where if they do something with a creature that they have a trophy of, they could get advantage or they could research a more powerful thing or something. I don't know. But yeah, rules is written. It don't do diddly dick. Uh, you know, that's a shame because I feel like you could have used that one to basically play like a monster hunter game, right? Like. You can get yeah. monster bits and then you can turn those monster bits into special gear or weapons or armor or whatever. That's a lot of design, sir. Yeah, but like it'd be worth it. Yeah, but like that's a lot of work. <laughs> um, I guess. Or you can get a trinket trophy. You commission the hirelings to search for a trinket that might be of use. After seven days, the research concludes. Roll any die. That was funny how it said that. If the number is odd, they find nothing. If the number is even, they find a magic item. Roll on the implements common table, chapter seven, to determine what the magic item is. So they find you a common magic item. Just because. Can't wait for all those, all those magic, magic cloaks of billowing. Uh, yeah. Really put the room together. Uh, then you have the war room at level 17. This is one of the big boys. You have to have a fighting style feature or unarmored defense feature to make or to make the war room. You have a bunch of uh, loyal lieutenants that are veterans. Their, you know, stat block is a veteran. Um, 
They can issue, you can have them issue the recruit order and get you a small army of a hundred dudes or a small- A small army? Yes. <laughs> of a hundred dudes, hundred guards. Um, who will fight for you in a cause or reduce the number to 20 if you want them mounted on riding horses. Uh, it costs you one GP per day to feed each guard and each horse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wherever the army goes, it must be lead, led by you or one of your lieutenants, or it disbands. The army also disbands if it goes one day without being fed. One day. Otherwise, the army, army remains until it is destroyed or you command it to disband. So, yeah, you can have a small army. I kind of... I like that they're like, you can't keep it, like, because, I mean, you could, right? You kill a couple dragons, you'll keep that army for, like, a year. Yeah. But... <laughs> I do really love the you can just mobilize an army against a dragon. I mean, it does. And, it does also say you can't issue the recruit order again until your current army disbands or is destroyed. So you can't go over 100 technically rules is written. No, but you could you could walk an army up to an ancient dragon, kick its ass with action economy. Yes. Say, all right, guys, you get to go home now and then go back and do it again the next day. Although many of them will die. Look, that's fine. Many. Here's the thing, right? Many will die. Many of them will die, but you tell the ones who survive that they'll make extra money if they do survive. That is technically true. Sure, yeah. Well. And then really, they're actually, only going to want to have to fight one dragon. Is that technically <laughs> true if you're paying them the same no matter what? Shh. Yeah, I'm just saying. Shh. <laughs> Uh, I, well, I think this is the last level five one is a workshop. Basically, you choose one of the artisan tools from the player's handbook, you know, carpenters, cobblers, glass blowers, etc. Uh, you can have them make stuff that they could make with those tools, or you can have them if you're level nine plus, they can make a magic item implement. Uh, and then also source of inspiration after this is another weird short rest one. After you spend a short rest in your workshop, you gain heroic inspiration. You can't be gain this benefit again until you finish a long rest. Weird one. Uh, and yeah. you can enlarge the workshop for two. Every every workshop and every facility enlargement, 2000 GP, if you haven't already noticed. Yes. Uh, if you do so, the workshop gains two additional hirelings and three additional artisan tools that they can make stuff with. So... That's how you can make you can use the workshop to make your sort of wondrous items type shit. Uh, and then it's the Bastion events. Um, so the way it works is uh, if you do the maintain order, which is to say you're not at the Bastion and you do not give your Bastion an order, they just do maintain. The GM rolls a D100 on the event table and then they got uh, the events are all is well. Attack, criminal hiring, extraordinary opportunity, friendly visitors, guest, lost hireling, magical discovery, refugees, request for aid, and treasure. Um, all as well as as it sounds, attack, get attacked. Um, attack is, well, I guess I sh attack is an important one. So when you get attacked, uh, you roll 66. For each die that rolls a one, one Bastion defender dies. Remove these defenders from your roster. The Bastion has zero defenders. One of your special def special facilities, determined randomly, is damaged and forced to shut down. Uh, special facilities that shut down can't be used on your next Bastion turn, after which it is repaired and made operational again at no cost to you. Uh, criminal hireling is one of your hirelings is a criminal. And you can pay 1d6 times 100 GP to just, you know, hush money, basically. To, to, to either pay them off or to do things for you? No, to pay off like the cops. Oh. So they don't arrest your hireling. <laughs> because if the hireling is gone, then the facility can't do anything until you get a new one. Right, right, right. <laughs> you could just be like, guys, just it's fine. Don't worry about it. I wonder, in theory, how many cops, how many like towns guard you'd have to blow up before they just stopped bothering. Stop trying, yeah. It's like you look. You can arrest him, but I just want you to know that I've laid glyphs of warning all over this place within an area of a hundred feet. 
approach at your own risk. You just gotta call your hireling up like, how far did they get? Uh, five feet this time? You're like, yeah, it's closer than yesterday. <laughs> they're learning. They're, tr they're trying. Yeah. Um, They'll get you eventually. He's <laughs> like, yeah, in like six months. Yeah, eventually, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll move out by then, it'll be fine. Um, extraordinary opportunity, basically you could just like host a party, pay 500 gold, and then, uh, you know, get the influencer. It's basically you could host a fat party and the king will be like, dude, party was sick, bro. You need anything? <laughs> basically, shit like that. Yeah. Uh, friendly visitors. Uh, you have some homies who show up. They offer to pay you some money to hang out. The example it gives is like some knights who want to use your smithy. Uh, you can get a guest who is a special guest of some kind such as an individual of great renown who stays for a week at the end of their stay. They give you a letter of recommendation. Yeah. A friendly monster. So just Lathander rocking up, having a good time. <laughs> a mercenary who helps defend. A bit like that. Uh, lost hirelings. You, you lose some hirelings, they fuck off. Uh, magical discovery. Your hirelings discover or accidentally create an uncommon magic item of your choice at no cost to you. The magic item must be a potion or scroll. I thought that one was funny. They're just like, uh, boss. That, that one's funny. That one's also a little weird. It's like a magic item of your choice. Yeah. But it has to be a scroll. Or potion. And it's not my, it's not my, not my choice. Well, it's your choice of potion okay. or scroll. I guess. You know, technically. Um, I just think I just love the idea of like, uh, boss, we were, we were making, we we're trying to make a healing potion and we made, um, a, a potion of invisibility. I don't, I, I'm not really sure how we manage that, but, uh, here you go. I guess I don't know. <laughs> you want it. Yeah. Um, refugees is another event where. 2d4 refugees fleeing from a monster attack, natural disaster, or some other calamity hang out. Uh, they offer you some money for your hospitality. They stay until you find them a new home or a hostile force attacks your bastion. I like the idea that they're like, can we have refuge? Can we like hide out? And you're like, yeah, sure. And then like a week later, the dragon that was following them like rocks up and they're like, uh, all right, guess we're leaving again. <laughs> Yeah. Like, oh, I like that. It's like, hey, can we stay the night? Yeah. And then three months later, it's like, can y'all leave? So like, we don't have anywhere to go. Yeah. That's not my fucking problem. That's not my problem. Get the fuck out of my house. Either you work or you get the fuck out. Yeah. And then they hit you with squatters rights and then you hit them with a meteor. Well, that's extreme. Um, and then another, effective. Another one is request for aid, which is basically just. You know, a local someone is like, oh, we need help with a missing person or brigands. And then you send your bash your defenders to go deal with the problem. And uh, you could potentially get some money out of it. Yeah, see, OK, that's cool. That's really cool thematically, right? Because yes. that makes you feel like the level 10 NPC who's hiring the, the newbies. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of really cool potential for those newbies that you hire to either become your next characters or your replacement characters if you die horribly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, the book mentions. Uh, I think it mentioned it somewhere where it's like if your bastion gets attacked, for example, you could have a scene where you play as your your defenders like you. You as the players play as the defenders defending the bastion as like secondary characters. So you make like level two you know, fighters or whatever. Um, so it does talk about that a little bit, actually. Yeah. Um, which could be fun or annoying, depending on how you feel about that kind of a vibe, right? Like. Depend. It depends if it happens too often, it'll get annoying, of course. Yeah. So it's a delicate balance. Um, and then the last potential Bastion event is treasure. Uh, your Bastion acquires an art object or magic item determined by rolling on the table. How it acquires this treasure is up to you. It might represent inheritance, gift from a guest, a theft. I, I like the theft one because I like the idea that you're a rogue with like a thieves guild hall. And you just rock up. He's like, hey, uh, hey, boss, we stole this cloak. You want it? And you're like, uh, what? I, uh, I mean, 
I guess. <laughs> Where did you get that from? We stole it from Wizard. God damn it. Which wizard? <laughs> don't don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, he uh he had a really big beard and a tall hat. <laughs> oh dear Neptune. <laughs> Listen, don't worry, we took his name off of the outs like we he had he had his name sewn in, we took it out so nobody'll know. <laughs> his name was a uh, Mal Monster? Yeah, something like oh, that. Oh no. Um, but yeah, you get a little piece of treasure, art object, or like an uncommon magic item, basically. If you roll a 99 or a 100, you get a free rare magic item. Ooh. Jeff will roll 99 or 100. Slim chance. 2%. Uh, wait, but is it is it rare, but it has to be a <laughs> no, no, potion? No. no, it says rare okay. magic item, okay. and it can be arcana, arcana, armament, implement, or relic. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Um, and then it just talks a little bit about how bastions can fall um, and they they kind of can't they're kind of rules is written invincible it's like divestiture which is to say like you know uh, a character gives up their bastion neglect which is if they don't get any orders for a certain period of time uh, what is it number of turns equal to the character's level uh the hirelings just abandon it um or ruination which is if you draw the ruin card from the deck of many things instantly deprives the character of their bastion when such an event occurs the player can decide what terrible fate befalls the bastion it just explodes it just explodes so they're they're pretty hard to get rid of like a, your bastion getting attacked can't destroy it rules is written completely it'll just destroy facilities and make it harder to use i if i was centering my campaign a lot around the bastion thing i would probably add a little more um like uh danger to that um but yeah rules is written it can't be like destroyed by a siege which feels a little odd. I think it's weird that they can, like, as long as your guys are getting paid, I can't imagine why they'd leave. Well, it says they leave. Uh, yeah, it says they leave if you don't issue any orders, which I guess the idea, it says typically because the character is dead or otherwise out of commission. So I guess the idea is they leave because they're like, oh, I guess the boss is dead. Which, I mean, I guess. Er. <laughs> Get back here, you motherfucker. I write your checks. Yeah, something like that. And uh, that's the end of the Bastion chapter is the fall of Bastions. So you can see what I was saying, where it's basically 100 percent mechanics. Yeah, I, I think I, if I did this, I'd want to do a little extra work to make the flavor stuff worth it. Yeah. You know, um, maybe if you get the dining room, you can heal one extra hit die like you get an extra hit die for free. Uh you know, the bedrooms make it so that you can have... They actually did this in Hellscapes. They had, like, the comfortable and the well-fed conditions. Right, right. That one lets you get... Um, one let you move at faster speeds if you were uh, well-rested or well-fed. And if you were well-rested, you got to uh, take an extra inspiration. But it only lasted 24 hours, of course. Right, right. Yeah, I mean... You, you see what I mean, though, where the Bastion system is, is weird, right? There's Yeah, it's a little, yeah, it's a little futzy. I'm, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it, but it's, yeah. It's I, not it, bad, but it definitely, the way you put it. Uh, it needs a little elbow grease. Yeah, it needs elbow grease to really make it feel legit and like use it well, which I mean, I guess you could argue that's just all of 5e. So, yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, I mean, it's the kind of thing I would definitely use, but I would not use it out the box as is. I would use it with some extra sauce. I put a little soy sauce on that rice. I, yeah, I mean, you could, it just, it would feel really half baked. Well, I think the problem is that it's not that it would feel half baked, but it would definitely there would be optimal choices and people would go for the very obviously better op like the, the the trade goods facility where it's like you just make a shitload of money is like just an amazing choice to take, you know, like 
That's so good. It's hard to argue with that one. Yeah, why wouldn't you? Yeah, or the meditation chamber is just hilariously strong. It's very good, yeah. Yeah, like advantage on just two saves is kind of amazing. So I think that's my main issue is just that the rewards of the various facilities are a little out of whack. And some of them are completely useless. So, or the, not the rewards, but what the facility can do, I should say, mechanics of it. Yeah. So. They, they don't do much, if anything. Yeah. And then the basic facilities feel strange. I also just, I don't know, I feel like if I was designing this system, I would have made special facilities cost gold to add. Because that's kind of the main oh, for crux sure, yeah. of the Bastion thing yeah. is like it's supposed to be a degree of a gold sink. Yeah, I mean, so I, I would say, right. You should get all of the like lowest level, like, you know, bedrooms, make them small dining room, make it small. All the the useless shit, make it free or just and then have them cheap. pay for it. or that too. And like act for me, the way I would do it is again like that stuff would be free and then at when you level up because you're presumably making money in the background as you're like just sort of casually playing the game it gets upgraded in size on its own and then it gets more slots to have that stuff installed you know yeah. so let's say at its smallest you can have one thing and then it levels up twice or once and then it can get three things and then five things and then eight things you know like yeah yeah, no, I follow. But, uh, yeah. The Bastion system. Now you know all you need to know. Uh, use it in your games however you see fit. I think you have or to. Or, like, you know, don't. <laughs> or don't. But, yeah, I think you have to spice it up. I don't, I don't think... I think using it just 100% as is, you're going to kind of miss out on some of the fun of it. Yeah, for sure. But the, that has been us. Follow on Twitter if you feel like it. Or don't. I don't even care at this point. Goodbye forever. Peace, motherfuckers. Oh, wait. Uh, Tell them about the thing. What thing? I, you follow us on Twitter. I literally just said that. Oh, did you? Damn it. Damn, bro. You deaf. Don't you fuck with me about me being deaf, Mr. I tune out whenever Isaiah talks. <laughs> Sometimes you go too deep down the Gundam rabbit hole and I just can't stay in. It, it, when the episode is about fucking Gundam, I know, you I know, can't I know, go I'm too sorry. deep down the fucking Gundam. Sorry, I'm sorry. I tried. I'm sorry. That's it. I'm killing myself in Minecraft answer. so we don't get canceled. Uh, unaliving yourself, sir? Yeah, that in Minecraft. <laughs> right, 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 right. Anyway, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.